This is America's Roundtable from Washington, D.C., a weekly radio program with leading voices and thinkers representing the academia, business media, think tanks, and the political arena. I am Joel and Sami, your co-host, joined by Natasha Sardorch, economist and co-founder of the International Leaders Summit. At America's Roundtable, we are pleased to have as one of our distinguished guests this weekend, Dr. Mark Skousen. Dr. Skousen is the editor of Forecasts and Strategies, a nationally known investment expert, economist, university professor, and author of more than 20 books. He recently was named one of the 20 most influential living economists. He earned his PhD in monetary economics at George Washington University in 1977. He currently holds the Benjamin Franklin Chair of Management and Grantham University, and he has taught economics and finance at Columbia Business School and Columbia University and has been a consultant to Fortune 500 companies. In fact, uh, Dr. Skousen, we would certainly like to extend to you a warm welcome on America's Roundtable. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Skousen. Glad to be with you. Well, this past week, uh, Dr. Skousen, the Wall Street Journal reported, and I quote, in the U.S., the Institute for Supply Management's Index of Manufacturing Activity fell to 49.5%, the lowest level in more than three years. Readings under 50 indicate activity shrinking instead of growing. Details of the report suggested that worries about whether Washington will keep the economy from tumbling off the so-called fiscal cliff, uh, tax increases and spending cuts set to arrive in 2013, have many manufacturers in a defensive crouch, unquote. Business leaders and investors around the nation are keeping a close watch on the impending fiscal crisis. And Dr. Mark Skousen, what brought us to this perilous cliff? And do we have time and the right solutions in front of us to move away from this grave crisis? Well, first of all, I think it's important you, you mentioned right from the beginning a manufacturing index. And there has been a traditional shift, historical shift, away from manufacturing and towards services um, and in information technology uh, in the United States and, and in every industrial uh, country, with perhaps the exception of China. Um, so uh, if, if we've had a three-year decline in manufacturing, I don't think that alone is a, a big negative, although I would say that there's no question that government has grown and the private sector has shrunk, relatively speaking, as a percentage of GDP, government continues to rise, and that's the crisis, and that actually started ever since 9-11. Uh, the, the war type of environment is what initially brought on, even among a, a, a so, uh, alleged conservative uh, Republican leadership, I mean, remember back in 2001, I believe, the Republicans controlled uh, all the uh, uh, all three levels of government, and that was, and, and yet they they failed uh, to uh, provide that limited government that we we talk about. So the fiscal crisis has been building, and of course uh, became very clear with the 2008 financial uh, collapse that was uh, largely due to the real estate bubble. So uh, we're, we're still facing that particular crisis, and I don't think we're making any serious effort. We're putting a little dent in it, but we're not making any real serious effort to reverse it. And I might say that other countries have, like Canada is my favorite example of the mid-'90s who, uh, who did turn things around. Uh, I, I think the publicity is all around Japan. Are we going the way of, uh, of Japan into kind of a sluggish uh, – economy over the next 10 years, and, and perhaps we are, but it doesn't have to be that way. Right. A few weeks ago, Dr. Mark Miles from Global Economic Solution joined us from Boston, and, and we talked about his collaborative work with Arthur Laffer and the importance of taking a look at the Laffer curve and how incentives in, in the economy and uh, in the arena matter for individual citizens and stakeholders. And uh, the question is that in our economy today, are the incentives to work, save, and invest or are they disincentives which contribute to an economy in decline? Well, I think there's a lot of incentives still in the system uh, to engage the entrepreneur. I mean, Steve Jobs, look what he did uh, in his uh, uh, last 10 years of his life, how he reignited uh, Apple, uh, the, his, his company, to make it the largest uh, 
company in the world, at least in terms of market capitalization. So I do think entrepreneurship <clears throat> is there and is needs to be pursued. But unfortunately, I think what we see here is this overburdening of government, which re, which has restrained entrepreneurship. And this has been a result starting with the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley legislation that has really hurt the uh, public offerings. And the IPO market has really struggled ever since Sarbanes-Oxley and the collapse in the uh, in the tech uh, tech stocks in the early 2000s and then the financial crisis of 2008 added additional layers of uh, bureaucracy and re regulations on the entrepreneurial spirit we have uh, uh, Dodd-Frank uh, legislation which has really hurt the financial markets uh, and of course we have Obamacare which has uh, also created an additional burden. But I should also add that uh, that the Republicans in general, I think uh, it, I think we have to be careful here that we don't lay the blame purely on the Democrats. It's been uh, really a problem uh, across the board, across the political spectrum that we have hurt. And, there, and there's a tendency to do this. I remember seeing a, a chart recently uh, number of pages to explain i don't know if you either one of you have seen this chart or not a number of pages to explain uh, medicare uh and uh it's rising rising hy uh, hyperbolically <laughs> i mean it's just never ending the amount of regulations that keep being imposed on the economy and you wonder at what point is this going to uh, be the tipping point we talk about the tipping point uh or the um, what you know what what might break the camel's back here uh i don't think we've reached that point but we certainly are uh, headed in that direction for those of you that have joined us on america's round table we are delighted to have as our guest dr mark skousen he's the editor of forecasts and strategies a nationally known investment expert economist and university professor and author of more than 20 books. And Dr. Skousen, you've worked very closely and you continue to work with investors and those that are willing to uh, move their capital to the United States. Now, from that perspective, what is the sentiment among investors today when they look at regulation, uh, when they look at uh, the economy in the U.S.? Are they optimistic on the long term or uh, what is their read in regard to the economy today? Well, investors want to be optimistic, uh, and certainly they have been um, optimistic in the past, but the 2008 crisis really did, uh, was a shock to the system. And most of them have still not recovered. A lot of them are still in cash. I think uh, investors are, uh, in, like corporations, are uh, at all-time levels of, of liquidity just sitting on the sidelines waiting for some kind of uh, sense of where we're headed. You know, the markets hate uncertainty, and that's that's what what's being faced right now. And of course, many in, I've met many investors who have participated only partially in this uh, strong stock market recovery. The markets have recovered much better than the economy. Uh, I think there is some optimism that that is there, but it's not shared uh, by most investors. And you have to also remember that investors fought long and hard for these tax breaks, uh, for interest and dividends and capital gain, long-term capital gains down to 15%, which is an historic low. And that's all coming to an end. Even if this fiscal cliff is resolved, you do have a problem uh, with the 3.8%. This is just the first salvo. The 3.8% increase, uh, of this Obamacare tax that's being imposed on interest, dividends, and capital gains will uh, raise the rates. And so I think we're seeing an historic end to the low rates for capital, capital investment. And that's certainly not a good sign because it's always it's demonstrated economists have demonstrated that uh, the key to economic growth is to encourage capital formation and we've had uh, we've had a good run here but we're losing that edge
Dr. Skousen, uh, it just in a recent uh, Wall Street Journal article, uh, it was interesting to see that top U.S. firms, uh, they, uh, the title says, are cash rich abroad, but cash poor at home. And, uh, you know, having the risk, or not a risk, but they would be taxed at 35% rate on corporate profits if they repatriate uh, that, that revenue. So if there would be a low flat corporate tax rate, these companies would certainly bring their cash home. They would invest. They would increase employment. And just to maybe mention a few companies uh, that were mentioned, like Emerson Electric has $2 billion of cash, uh, but this year it had to borrow money in the U.S. to help buy back shares, distribute dividends, and even pay its taxes, still having that cash abroad. Then there's a mention of General Electric that has from 85.5 billion of total cash, uh, just 30 billion dollars are in the U.S. Uh, Microsoft has only 8.6 billion dollars in U.S. Uh, compared to some 60 billion that are abroad. So, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, Natasha, I'm glad you really you brought up a very important issue, and that is this uh, high corporate tax rate. And they say it's 35 percent, but I noticed that last week the CEO of Chevron announced uh, that uh, they paid uh, 43 percent tax rate. Uh, and this is a big oil company that's supposedly having all these uh, tax breaks that uh, and, and subsidies that everybody talks about, uh, $17 billion in taxes that they paid. It is a serious problem. Foreign corporations uh, see the U.S. as a tax haven. For U.S. companies, the tax havens are abroad. Uh, there is this... Uh, uh, we need more tax competition, I think, and, and one way to do it, and I think President Obama has even recognized this, a willingness to lower the uh, corporate tax rate. Now, Canada, I mentioned uh, just briefly earlier before the success of Canada that this is what gives me optimism about America is our story to the north, where Canada faced a very similar crisis in the mid-1990s that had been brought about by the Liberal Party of Canada and as a result, government as a percent of GDP was 53%. Uh, the Canadian dollar was falling like a rock. They had serious deficits, and there was a crisis there. The uh, party in charge, which is the Liberal Party of Canada, said enough is enough, and they fired like 60,000 federal workers, which is a very high number. Uh, anyway, they cut back programs, and they balanced their budget within two years, and then went on an 11-year supply-side tax cut policy when the corporate tax rate now is down to, I think it's under 15%. Indeed. Can you imagine? 15% uh, rate. And uh, they had no real financial crisis in 2008. They did have a little bit of deficits that they're working off now. But, uh, the, and, the, and the Canadian dollar made a rapid recovery. So I wish people would look at that Canadian story more because it really is, if we can follow what the Canadians did, I think that we could uh, uh, turn this, uh, turn around from the fiscal cliff, if you will. That knowledge is available, so why can't we see something similar happening in the U.S.? Well, one of the problems is uh, in, or in Canada, they actually had consensus uh, on both sides of the uh, aisle uh, on this, because, uh, and it was an interesting story, because the Liberal Party of Canada supported the, uh, the balanced budget because they, they noticed that a huge percent of the budget in Canada was going to pay interest on the debt, which meant that it was money going to wealthy uh, bondholders. And the, and the conservatives on uh, the Canadian side wanted to, to cut back the size of government. So you had a consensus on both sides. Unfortunately, uh, what we have here is uh, President Obama and the Democrats seem to be a little bit more ideological here in, in their argument that, uh, you know, government must be bigger. We need their into fairness, uh, social justice, all of these uh, arguments that make the case for a larger, more expansive government. And they really have a total distrust of the marketplace of capitalism in general. So there is really, if you, if you look at this, uh, these debates, uh, the whole issue is on the tax side, how to increase tax revenues, and there's really very little emphasis on um, 
entitlement reform or cutting back on government spending, I guarantee you that next year's budget is going to be substantially larger than last year uh, or the year before. And the reason is is because we're we're giving them more tax revenues. And even the Republican Party that took all this tax pledge, it seems like they're throwing it out the window and basically saying, yeah, we're, we're giving in to tax revenue increases, including deductions, legitimate mortgage deductions and charitable deductions for Americans own over $250,000. I mean, all of this is extremely bad policy and is going to make the tax, uh, the tax code double the size. I mean, the complexity of the tax code is just going to skyrocket as a result of these negotiations that are going on right now. This is a very dangerous period in our history. Indeed. In fact, uh, as you've mentioned, the example from Canada, and we've had uh, uh, Maurice McTeague uh, share about the experiences that he had as a leading cabinet member for reforms in New Zealand, what's happening in in Australia. It would be uh, amazing for uh, our fellow Americans to note that uh, 300 million citizens in Eastern Europe live in flat tax nations. And well, not only that, but Russia is one of them. The Russian debt is uh, rated one of the highest in quality uh, th- these days because they have a 13% flat tax that has really worked. Absolutely. And wouldn't it be ideal? Uh, I've, I've always loved uh, Steve Forbes' flat tax proposal, but uh, we live in a country where everybody is just fighting, and the result is... Uh, uh, we have no leadership. Uh, we need real leadership here to come in. And even even Mitt Romney, as a candidate, was muddying the waters with all kinds of uh, rules about uh, wealthy Americans being an exceptional class. Again, eliminate some of the deductions. Make the make the tax code complex rather than just lowering the rate, elimin- eliminating all the deductions, and just having a flat rate so that you can file your tax return. Uh, on a postcard, and that would do wonders for the accounting profession and the legal sit and our lawyers, and uh, so that they would have to go out and do real productive jobs instead of just the paperwork that is involved with the filing uh, and, and tax forms and and ways to get around it and all that sort of thing. It's a revenue neutral. A principle. The fact was that the tax revenue was in one year after the adoption of the flat tax in all the countries, without exceptions, in all the countries, the tax revenue was equal or even higher just one year after the implementation of the flat tax. So it is a proven reform that could work in the states as well. Well, I think the key is uh, is economic growth. We need to have a tax system and a government spending program that is pro-growth, and we don't have it on either level right now. It's a real struggle to go through the process of taxation. And as Milton Friedman has always demonstrated, it's the, it's the percent of GDP that goes toward government spending, which is, in, is the most important indicator. So we've been living on borrowed time running these huge deficits. And by the way, I do think a lot of the blame for the problems that we face today is the repeated blunders of uh, George Bush and the Republicans at this time. I, I, I think we don't give enough credit to the crisis, to uh, what happened uh, when the Republicans were in charge. They had a tremendous opportunity when they were in control of things that they would walk the walk rather than just talk the talk. Yes, indeed. In fact, uh, uh, U.S. Senator Tom Coburn was with us just not too long ago talking about his uh, new published, uh, annual published study, which is Waste Book 2012. And in that particular report, he estimated some nearly $300 billion of government waste spending that is unnecessary and uh, duplication as well as fraud. So you're right in mentioning that we have not really tackled some of the key issues of government spending and how much we have expended as a nation uh, on services and all these other programs, uh, but uh, have put forward a scenario where there is greater government dependency rather than a pro-growth agenda. Well, you know, if you go back to the early 80, uh, early 2000s, when we were at full employment, and even under Keynesian policy, and at full employment, you're supposed to be running a surplus. 
And the fact is that Bush administration and the Republican-led Congress did not do that, and that was for a lack of leadership. They should have said, look, even if we are fighting a, a new war uh, on terrorism, uh, we need to live within our means. And if he had done that, uh, we would not be facing the crisis that, that we're facing today. And and we would not have Obamacare, and we would not have the, the 2008 financial crisis uh, uh, there, there's a lot of issues, although we, we haven't discussed Federal Reserve policy, and I certainly think monetary policy has also should take some blame in the artificial low interest rate policy that uh, Alan Greenspan uh, and Ben Bernanke has continued has done in ter- terrible damage to our, uh, our monetary system. As we look at the future of America's economy, Uh, What is your prognosis of the future of America's economy, and are there leaders who can clearly articulate the importance of pro-growth solutions and also build a movement for principal reforms that you've been articulating? Well, I do. I think Senator Rand Paul and some of the people that uh, have recently been uh, elected uh, have a great vision uh, and something that is is not the... uh, the approach that has been taken in the past. Uh, so leadership is out there, and it's just a question, has the American people become so benefit corrupted that whether they will be able to accept that? Now, when you have slow growth, if we have four more years of slow growth and high unemployment, I mean, after a while you get tired of your uh, your 20- and 30-year-old uh, children living at home. <laughs> and uh, you know, there may be uh, a willingness to uh, see that change. So if we see a more dynamic type of uh, candidate, then, then we could see this. But let me also just uh, quote Adam Smith, who I think has made a, a really important statement. He once said uh, after the Battle of uh, Saratoga in the United States uh, during the American Revolution, when uh, the British lost and they ran up to Adam Smith and said, uh, our country is ruined, our country is ruined. And Smith said, well, you know, there's much ruin in a nation. And that that can be taken two ways. One is there's a lot of, uh, you could take it optimistically and say, look, at, uh, uh, no matter how incompetent government is, and Adam Smith himself expressed this optimism, uh, that no matter how incompetent uh, the government is, the invisible hand will continue to work, and creative ways will be found to uh, work around the system and to improve one's, uh, one's standard of living. So that's the optimism that I always have. But on the other hand, uh, you could also interpret there's much ruin in a nation to suggest that there's still a lot that government could do badly and uh, could destroy in, uh, in a great country. So I, I think there's a two-edged sword there, and we need to uh, – we, we have these challenges, and there's a – the great Austrian economist Friedrich Weiser, he talked about uh, the great man theory or the great woman theory, whichever the point is that a great person, whether it's in government or religion uh, or uh, in uh, business, a single person can make a huge difference. Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, I think, said it best. He says it's incredible the quantity of good that a single man or a single woman can do when they make a business out of it. And we have a tremendous 300 plus million uh, Americans out there and and around the world uh, who are making a big difference with uh, uh, non-government agency, you know, NGOs and with uh, these think tanks that you are involved with. There's a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship still going on there. And so while most of my friends remain very pessimistic about the future, and we certainly face many challenges, uh, I still maintain that optimism that Adam Smith and Benjamin Franklin and other uh, early founders of uh, politics and economics shared. Do you perhaps see some additional checks and balances that should be uh, introduced in the system to improve it at this stage? Because we've, we have seen uh, more of uh, crony capitalism creeping in the system and going away from the free market economy that is based on the rule of law, protection of property rights and independent judiciary. Well, I do think that uh, we need to maintain what we have 
certainly this uh, Geithner and Obama suggesting the possibility that Congress give up its power to veto a rise in the national debt, I think, is one that has to be maintained as a check and balance. And, and in fact, I've always thought this is if if Republicans were ever serious about really controlling the debt, they just simply say, from now on, we're going to have a balanced budget. And, the, and, and they could do it simply by saying, hey, we will not raise the national debt. That would force the government to live on a balanced budget right there. So the powers are there if they had the guts. Uh, but yeah, look, you live in Washington, D.C. You've seen how it has grown over the last 30 or 40 years since World War II. It, it has, I mean, it's just the K Street and the lobbyists and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure there is a way uh, a, around uh, that kind of influence. That's a good question to ask the public choice, the public choice economists at George Mason University. They may have some uh, s solutions to that. I certainly think a balanced budget amendment right. is a good one. Uh, a flat tax is a great idea, but we have to live within our means, but, but not only live within our means, but at a low t tax level, uh, because, uh, you know, I teach, I teach economics. I've taught economics at Columbia and several other places. And when we get into tax policy, you know, we talk about the benefit principle. And you don't just pay taxes uh, based on ability to pay. You pay taxes on, based on uh, accountability. And if you if you pay for a government service, it's because you're you're benefiting from it, and you should pay accordingly. So you know the lower the tax rate, and the more money you can put in the hands of the private sector, the better. This is the the biggest danger about a progressive tax, is that you're you're taking away money. I thought of this, uh, you know, Warren Buffett uh, talking about the benefits uh, that we that w w the wealthy should pay more. Well, I, you know, and I've I've met Warren Buffett a couple of times, and when I meet him again, I'd like to ask him, who do you think could better use that additional money that you think should be paid in taxes and go to Washington? Uh, it, the private sector, you, do you think you could use that uh, $10 million better, or do you think the government with its uh, defense uh, department and uh, the Department of Education I mean, the Department of, this is a good example of uh, where we're headed is the Department of Education. My wife, Joanne, is uh, the director of the Learning Center here up at Mercy College in New York. And she says uh, over half the time is just dealing with the, the inane rules and regulations that the Department of Education puts out. It's just a total bureaucracy uh, the Department of Education has a bunch of bureaucrats, and imagine if that money could be used just in the classroom yeah. to improve teaching with directly with teachers. Uh, so that's a huge area that we could really improve on is our education. But right now, the Department of Education, which again grew dramatically under George Bush, with No Child Left Behind, which, and, and by the way. My wife indicates that students today are not thinking on their own. They don't know history. They're not thinking on their own. They're just regurgitating the facts to pass a test. That's all that is going on. And uh, we're, we're, developed, we're being left behind uh, in a global competitive environment because we are not educating our children the way they should be. Uh, to be prepared to think and and not just to uh, regurgitate answers on a test. Indeed. Uh, we appreciate your optimism for America and some of the principles that you have outlined. Uh, we encourage our listeners to visit your website at markscalson.com and, in fact, uh, read through some of the uh, analysis and the reports that you have. And for our listeners, uh, we are joined by Mark Skousen. Dr. Skousen is the editor of Forecasts and Strategies, a nationally known investment expert, economist, university professor, and author of more than 20 books. Uh, he recently was named one of the 20 most influential living economists. And uh, Dr. Skousen, we certainly look forward to continuing our discussion in the days to come. And we just want to let our listeners know that we'll 
will be spending some time talking about Freedom Fest, an initiative that you founded uh, some years ago, and uh, learn more about some of the speakers and the events that you will be having early, uh, actually in the summer of 2013. Well, I look forward to it as well, Joel, and uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, and I I do hope that uh, I, I think we have a great future. As Benjamin Franklin always said, America has a great future, and uh, I, I am I'm glad to be uh, in. And we live in interesting times where we have the opportunity, uh, the challenge, if you will, uh, to really make a difference. And with uh, your work, Joel and Natasha, I think that's a real possibility, and I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, that coming from a direct descendant of Benjamin Franklin, we're truly <laughs> honored, and uh, we thank you well, so I did much. Well, inherit, I did inherit uh, being left-handed. Uh, that's about all I inherited <laughs> from Ben Franklin. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Once well, again. Thank you, Dr. Skousen. All right. Thank you. This is America's Roundtable. Visit us at americasrt.com. Follow us on Twitter at America's RT. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. Like and share.